Welcome to the Weekly Roundup Show. Today, we'll be touching on the US FDA granting access protocol to RLF100 for severe COVID-19 cases. Then, two physicians at Beloit Memorial Hospital in Wisconsin are on to a COVID-19 therapy involving famotidin. And then we have hydroxychloroquine politicization, which continues as Ohio Board of Pharmacy bans the drug and then rescinds. Now, all this and so much more is coming up on our program today. And of course, I'll be reading some of the comments left on our show from last week. From Trial Site News, I'm Adrian, and the Weekly Roundup starts now. The US FDA granted Relief Holding, AG, a company from Switzerland and their American development partner, NeuroRx, an expanded protocol for treatment of respiratory failure in COVID-19 with RLF100, a synthetic form of vasoactive intestinal peptide, or VIP. They did this because during trials, it was revealed that the antiviral VIP therapy provided rapid respiratory failure reduction in most clinically ill patients with COVID-19. Now, all this at a time when independent research also revealed that the drug blocks replication of SARS-CoV-2 in human lung cells and monocytes. This emergency use authorization from the FDA, which makes the treatment available to patients who have exhausted standard COVID-19 therapies and are not eligible for the current phase two and three clinical trial of RLF100 due to confounding medical conditions and specifically makes the treatment available to pregnant women. Now, this drug is still under investigation. It is not yet approved. However, due to the rapid recovery from respiratory failure in COVID-19 seen under the FDA emergency use authorization, trial site news wanted to better understand what the underlying properties of this investigational product are. So, vasoactive intestinal peptide, also known as vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, or VIP, is a peptide hormone that is vasoactive in the intestine. VIP is a peptide of 28 amino acid residues, the ligand of class 2G protein-coupled receptors. So, the hope here, then, is that the rug candidate RFL100 may have twofold benefit in patients with coronavirus, including rapid respiratory failure reduction in the most clinically ill patients with COVID-19, and separate research reveals it may block replication of the virus. Further research of RLF100, which is being developed as a material threat medical countermeasure in coordination with federal agencies, including the National Institutes of Health, is planned to bolster these findings. And the therapy has received fast-track designation from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And of course, we'll be keeping you posted on this story as it continues to develop. Two highly respected physicians from Beloit Memorial Hospital in Wisconsin recently uploaded the results of their hospital case series research for the world to review. A very well-respected researcher associated with the U.S. government suggested to trial site news to review their work. These physicians articulate that famotidin, a histamine H2 receptor inverse agonist commonly used to treat mast cell activation syndrome, symptoms including anaphylaxis, reduced COVID-19 mortality in one hospital-based retrospective study. The Wisconsin-based providers introduced prostaglandin E2, a naturally occurring prostaglandin used as a medication, controls various characteristics and adaptive immune responses, such as mast cell activation. The providers point out a prospective study involving patients hospitalized for COVID-19, where the administration of the COX-2 antagonist, celecoxib, not only inhibited PGE2 levels, but also prevented clinical degradation and was also connected with improved CT chest improvement. Hence, the Beloit Memorial Hospital providers put forth their hypothesis. Adjuvant therapy with a combination of siloxib with famotidin could very well improve outcomes in hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Trial site news will be following the two physicians, including Dr. Kevin Tamora and Dr. Joseph Kitta. And of course, we'll be keeping you posted on this story as it continues to develop. 
Trial site news recently reported on the recent impressive Laron Lamab results and questions why their lack of interest in this investigational therapy. Developed by a small Vancouver biotech called Cytodyne, trading under the symbol CYDY, Trial Site News recently covered announcements out of the prestigious Baylor University Medical Center, which announced its initiative to study the therapy due to its apparent ability to inhibit lung inflammation associated with COVID-19. Hence, the largest not-for-profit health system in Texas was selected by the biotech company to participate in an ongoing Phase 3 clinical trial. Now, in the meantime, the company reported impressive preliminary results from its Phase 2 clinical trial. Now, some analysts question why the medical and research establishment aren't giving this potential therapy more attention. Many have sent direct comments to Trial Site News asking this very question. And so we can see from a Phase 1 trial of Laron Lamab, some results were also very upbeat. Those patients on Laron Lamab experienced 63% less serious adverse events than the control group. Overall, 58% less patients were impacted by SAE. The drug reduces the viral load in COVID-19 patients to zero in 14 days. And the company will seek an emergency use authorization from the FDA to allow patients to address unmet need. And of course, Trial Site News will keep an eye on the Laron Lamab studies going forward. Now, before we delve deep into this past week's story, a brief refresher of the clinical trial site market in the United States. Traditionally segmented by either major academic medical centers, health system, hospital research arm, nonprofit research institutes, or independent clinical research site operation. Now, it's this latter type of organization that major biopharma sponsors and CROs like to work with due to their ability to be agile, responsible, and efficient. However, the clinical research site market is highly fragmented with numbers varying from a few thousand to 30,000. Now, however fragmented this market segment is, there are consolidation trends as private equity has moved into investment in the dynamic world of clinical research. Different types of models are emerging, and one is that of a tightly controlled consolidator that almost starts to look like a CRO itself. And this would be the Velocity Clinical Research Model. Trial Site News reports that the Durham-based research site organization continues to execute on its goal to expand the company's national base of research sites while transforming the research sector from one of many fragmented smaller sites and at times non-responsive networks to a more scalable model, one that looks like a clinical research organization. And so, recently, the research organization announced the delivery of day one doses for the Moderna Phase 3 mRNA-1273 clinical trial. As Operation Warp Speed-based research progresses to the pivotal Phase 3 clinical trials, known risk factors emerge from challenges in patient recruitment to unforeseen scientific and patient observations that could potentially impede the expedited program. The full utilization of this new breed of research site may be timely. The Durham-based group with a national presence could very well emerge as the type of organization that can best help Operation Warp Speed maintain its timelines. Now, Trial Site News also announced that Velocity Clinical Research is the only research site we know of that has sites working on each and every vaccine trial in the United States. A true accomplishment, and it indicates the momentum that organization is building in the world of clinical trials. Meanwhile, researchers from the Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital have uncovered that children younger than five years of age with mild to moderate COVID-19 appear to have a far greater levels of genetic material for the virus in the nasal passages as do older children and adults. Now, these findings contradict other findings that show children are infected at lower rates than elder children or adults. But the new findings out of Chicago certainly raise concern about the role children may have in spreading this pathogen. Now, this is because the Chicago researchers have found that children may have 100 times more of the virus, specifically in the nose. Now, this study revealed that perhaps the youngest children may be the key transmitters of the disease. This insight may have been missed or under-recognized given the rapid and sustained closure of schools and daycare during the pandemic. Taylor Heald Sargent commented that we have found that children under five with COVID-19 have a higher viral load than older children and adults, which may suggest greater transmission as we see respiratory syncytial virus, also known as RSV. 
Now, this has important public health implications, especially during discussions on safety of reopening schools with daycare. Now, only in the age of COVID-19 have drugs become so politicized. For example, the drug of hydroxychloroquine, a drug that was promoted early on across the board as considered at least one early stage option to attempt to treat the novel coronavirus. Some of the world's largest studies, such as University of Oxford's COP-CoV, embraced the anti-malarial drug. But with the controversial Trump promotion, as well as intense scrutiny on the data thereafter, came the emergence of medicinal camps. And of course, such polarization tends to produce the data that fits into the convenient paradigm or worldview. Thereafter, a wave of data finding and evidence indicated the drug was either not safe or not effective. But on the other hand, some studies evidenced real benefits, such as the Henry Ford Healthcare System's study suggesting it can reduce the death rate. Regardless, in today's hyperpolarized and political world, investigational drug products can actually be associated with a movement, a cause, and even a political ideology. And so, the Ohio governor brings the hydroxychloroquine conflict to the next level. Mike DeWine, in response to a ban on the drug by the Ohio Board of Pharmacy, declared the ruling should be reconsidered. Two days later, that same board flipped and reversed its decision after the governor's urge for reconsideration. And while hydroxychloroquine's jury isn't done deliberating, Remdesivir cleans house with a projected $1 to $3 billion in blockbuster-style sales for a drug not even officially approved by the US FDA. So what is going on here? So, remdesivir is granted exceptional status, so much so that the actual trial endpoints were changed last minute by the NIAID and the sponsor, with data that the drug reduces COVID-19 hospitalization by a few days. It's had a full embrace and acceptance by the US FDA. And thanks to that move, top analysts forecast the drug maker, Gilead, will generate between one and three billion dollars in 2020 alone on a drug that isn't even officially approved by the FDA as it's under emergency use authorization. So for this next story, there is presently no available FDA-approved medicine that can be administered at a patient's home that can prevent the negative progression of SARS-CoV-2 symptoms, leading to hospitalization and potentially death. So can a widely available generic drug used for gout change this? Well, based on preclinical animal research, the Montreal Heart Institute thinks potentially it can. Now, the Montreal's Heart Institute's Call Corona clinical trial has expanded its enrollment capacity in the United States as the number of positive COVID-19 cases continue to rise. The Call Corona trial recruits recently diagnosed non-hospitalized adult patients with COVID-19 for participation in a free at-home clinical trial designed to minimally burden patients. So purportedly the largest of its kind, this at-home contactless trial continues to additionally enroll participants in Canada, Spain, and South Africa. Recent expansion in America includes Los Angeles, San Francisco, Houston, Dallas, Miami, Gainesville, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. So what is colchicine? Well, orally administered, this medicine is used to treat gout and Bequette's disease. Colchicine is preferred over NCAIDS or steroids in the former diagnosis according to some reports that we have seen. The drug has an impact of reducing inflammation via multiple mechanisms. Now, like most drugs, it does come associated with side effects, including gastrointestinal issues, especially at higher doses. Severe side effects can involve low blood cells. Now, although it isn't clear if use during pregnancy is safe, at least some data indicates its use is safe during breastfeeding. But excessive doses can lead to death. Now, for those who may be interested in this trial, here is a brief review of what patients should know. This study is very different in that it doesn't require the patient to leave home. Study staff contact the patient directly via phone or video visits for follow-up. Medication or a placebo is delivered to the home at no cost. This study is one of a few that is enrolling newly diagnosed patients with mild to moderate symptoms who are not hospitalized and over the age of 40. 
Now, study participation lasts 30 days, and when the study is completed, the results will be announced, but will not include any patient identifying information. So, if you meet the inclusion criteria and have an interest in participating in the Cull Corona trial, you can call the hotline or visit the website at cullcorona.net. And we, of course, will provide a link to our article on this story, and all those details and more, including the hotline, phone number, and website for the study will be available there. And finally, we come to the part of the show where we highlight a few of the comments left from our audience on the previous episodes. And we, of course, read them all, but we can't respond to all of them. From last week's Weekly Roundup, Kevin O'Neill says, Thanks for the helpful information on Cytodyne's lorolimab trials. Thank you, Kevin. We appreciate your feedback. From our recent interview with Teresa Dysher, with whom we discussed supercharging the body's own natural immune response, O'Sullivan says, absolutely fascinating, great choice of interviewee. Thank you. It was indeed an intriguing concept, and we were glad she had time to sit down and speak with us. Now, before we bring this episode to a close, I'd like to also point out a post we put up on this channel asking for your feedback. We want to hear from you. What series is your favorite that we produce? What information would you like us to cover that we aren't? Leave your feedback below or email it to us at admin at trialsitenews.com. And so that brings this episode to a close. As always, thank you for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you all again next time. From Trial Site News, I'm Adrian, and this has been the Weekly Roundup.